Hello, Samosa, Shield Asai here. Today, I wanted to talk to you about violence against Asian Americans. As you may have seen reported in the news recently, there has been a disturbing increase in cases where Asian Americans were targeted by people who wanted to do them harm. Joining me today about this issue is Manju Kulkarni. She is the executive director at the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. Last March, she co-founded co uh, Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate, or AAPI Hate. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the nation's leading aggregator of COVID-19 related hate incidents against AAPIs. Her work has been featured in a number of publications, including the New York Times, CBS News, and CNN. Manju, welcome. Thanks so much uh, for having me, Sheil. Of course, no, thank you for being here. So first off, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the work that you do? Sure. Um, so I am executive director of an organization in Los Angeles called APCON, the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, as you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. We're a coalition of over 40 community-based organizations that together serve and represent the 1.5 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Los Angeles County. That includes South Asian Americans. It includes individuals who are East Asian, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Southeast Asian, and Pacific Islander. Um, and prior to this position, I uh, worked at um, a South Asian organization called South Asian Network, which I led for five and a half years serving very specifically the needs of uh, the Desi community, uh, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Nepali, and Sri Lankan. And uh, before that, I was a civil rights and health attorney. Wow, excellent. Uh, so what is the history of violence against AEPIs and how it has changed to what is happening today? So, we know that, um, you know, from other data sets that typically um, in any given year, there were actually a very small number of hate incidents or hate crimes against Asian Americans, um, you know, between say, you know, two and 50 in any given year. And then when last year, uh, just before COVID hit Southern California, we actually had our first incident uh, of hate that was related to the disease against the Asian American community. Uh, a boy who was in middle school was physically attacked and verbally assaulted by another kid in his class. And he was told, you know, he said, the other child said, hey, you're a COVID carrier, go back to China. And when the child responded, I'm not Chinese, he was punched in the head 20 times. Um, and what was really disturbing about this incident is that it, um, it actually took place before there was a single confirmed case of COVID in uh, Los Angeles County. So what that told us is that the racism actually spread faster than the disease or the virus itself. Um, and so we set up with Chinese for Affirmative Action and San Francisco State University, this website. It's now the nation's leading aggregator of incidents against Asian Americans. And within a, a few weeks of March 19th, we got several hundred incident reports from across the country. We're now at just under 3,000, uh, which are from 50 states in the District of Columbia. So, you know, really different atmosphere. I do want to, though, make two caveats. One is that, you know, folks in the South Asian American community will know and understand that this is not the first time it's happened to Asian American communities. Mm -hmm. Within the last 20 years, really, we've seen and experienced a backlash against our communities, uh, really, because of 9 11. Um, it especially hit Muslim Americans uh, the hardest and also our Sikh uh, American sisters and brothers. And the first three people actually who were killed after 9-11 were all South Asian. One was mm -hmm. Muslim, one was Sikh, and one was Hindu. Um, so we know that's happened. And then also we know that, you know, hate has been part of really the fabric of America, even against the Asian American community from the 1800s and the Chinese Exclusion Act to the uh, 1900s Japanese American internment and the killing of Vincent Chin. So unfortunately there's nothing new here. It's just the latest iteration. Yeah, you actually you bring up a great point with Vincent Chin. So 
you may know that Samosa is based here in Michigan and I've been here since the 80s. So I mean, I mean the 70s, sorry. <laughs> so I've been around here for a long time, but I was a kid in the 80s. And uh, when Vincent Chin, I think it was in 82, was killed uh, by a couple of Detroit men who were very upset about what was happening to the auto industry because of uh, Japan starting their auto industry and how it was affecting uh, the local union workers here. Um, they thought that he was Japanese and uh, they killed him. So one of the things that happened is that uh, there's a lot of outrage. I know as a kid, I even had heard about this and it was talked about in my house. Um, and then, you know, when I was a little bit older, I was able to find out that actually pretty much nothing happened to those men that killed him. You know, they paid like a $3,000 fine and uh, served no jail time because they uh, pled to manslaughter. So what is the Justice Department doing now to uh, address what's happening? Well, that's a great question. And thank you for you know sharing that background. Um, you're exactly right. Nothing was done at the time. And you know what we've seen unfortunately in 2020 um, was a concerted effort by President Trump and the administration against the Asian American community, really fanning the flame of hate uh, putting people in harm's way, not only with the rhetoric of Wuhan virus, China virus, Kung flu, but also with policies that were really detrimental. And so what we were glad to see on January 26th, uh, within just the first week of the new Biden administration taking office, is a 180 degree shift. So we saw first off that the new president condemned that language, the racist rhetoric. So that was obviously a huge relief. And then secondly, directing um, the Department of Justice to work with communities to take action. Um, of course, with the department itself, we are still waiting upon the confirmation of Merrick Garland, along with Benita Gupta and others, um, which, you know, are in process right now, but we're, we are really hopeful. We had a chance to meet with the Biden transition team, share our data with them, and then able um, to really uh, create some recommendations so that we know once they're in office, we can, how exactly we wanna move forward. That's great, sounds like, uh your vote does matter. So who you have in office matters. And then, you know, if you're seeking justice, uh, you got to make sure that the right people are in office to make sure that they are representing you and your interest. Um, so speaking of which, you know, uh, almost four years ago in Kansas, uh, a uh, Indian man was shot and killed. Uh, his friend, I think, was injured as well. And uh, the man that was shooting at them was telling them to get out of his country. Um, do you have any information about how South Asians are being targeted? Uh, if there's any increase there or like anything that um, you see as a disturbing new trend? Well, we have seen um, that some of the incidents recently have come, uh, have been reported by South Asian Americans. Um, I don't know if um, the folks in the audience might know of, you know, just even everyday things that are happening against our community members. There was a videotape released, um, I think at a Sam's Club or Walmart where an individual, white individual was verbally right. attacking an in, uh, Indian couple uh, about wearing masks, right? And so you, you know, point to what happened, unfortunately, to Srinivas Kochibotla, and those things are all too common. And I think that's what sort of this new era of white supremacy is showing us that um, that actually white supremacy has been part of the fabric of American life. And that, you know, as South Asian Americans, we've experienced this, you know, many times in many different ways. I have to tell you that my own family uh, growing up experienced discrimination. Um, we were in Montgomery, Alabama, and my mother uh, was a physician, and uh, and she and my father brought a lawsuit because she basically was not hired uh, for a position at the hospital with the uh, the interviewing committee telling her, you know, oh, why are you people coming to the United States and stealing our jobs? 
I mean, just literally racist language in the interview. And so luckily with the help of an attorney uh, with the Southern Poverty Law Center, they were successful. And, uh, you know, it showed me two things, even as a child. One is that this racism, unfortunately, is with us and something we would have to endure, but also that the law and policy can provide solutions. So that's really important. I mean, that's probably why in many ways I chose a, a career in the law, but I also look right now to policies for our overall Asian American Pacific Islander community, uh, because you know while we can do things on an individual basis and we can be upstanders for each other uh, to say something when we see something happening, uh, we really do need stronger civil rights laws uh, on the books. We need our government to take action when hate incidents happen. Um, so to me, that's really the lesson of, of um, you know, Mr. Kochibotla's uh, case as well as so many others. Yeah, and it sounds like you've had some personal experience with that too. And where I grew up was in a predominantly white uh, town and I felt pretty happy and safe there. Um, there were a few incidents, especially after the Persian Gulf War started, where I could, I had people yelling stuff at me from their car window as they drove by and, uh, you know, just other little things like that. And I guess for me personally, I didn't really understand the type of racism or the way that people felt about me until like I got older and I was able to reflect back and really understand some of the uh, circumstances and instances that uh, maybe seemed like not that big of a deal back then, but, you know, I could understand. But possibly the motivations for, for people and uh, you know, how it's treated and such. But um, yeah, um, so one question I have is, you know, we've got Asian Americans, South Asian Americans that are rising to prominence in a lot of different arenas, whether it's in politics, entertainment, business. Um, so do you anticipate that uh, we may become a bigger target just because we are more visible now and that it could be the subject of uh, of um, some hate that, you know, just because maybe perhaps before we weren't really seen as that much of a threat, but maybe we are now. Exactly. I think, you know, that time period you mentioned before with Vincent Chin happened because there was greater visibility and obviously a greater influence of the Japanese uh, car industry, right, coming to the United States. Um, I think now, you know, after 9-11, uh, similarly, there's more attention drawn um, essentially to our communities, but in a very negative way, right? And I think that there's what we see is sort of group culpability and, uh, you know, something that I think South Asian Americans with our um, uh, other Asian American sisters and brothers is that we see, we are seen as perpetual foreigners. So mm -hmm. it may be, you know, folks I work with and know they've been here for four or five generations, right? And yet they're still told, oh, your English is really good or where are you from or, you know, questions like that. And so I think unfortunately with uh, sort of the way we look, uh, we're not perceived as the, you know, person next door, right? Because we're not white. And that's part of that white supremacy ideology, which is that, uh, this is a country for, by, and, you know, created with white people. And so everybody else is sort of, uh, you know, has secondary status. And for folks who are uh, Asian American, that we, we belong somewhere else or we're from somewhere else. And, you know, I'm sad to say mm -hmm. I have uh, two teenagers now and they've even gotten that here in the city of Los Angeles, which you would think is, you know, one of the most diverse cities uh, in the country, if not the world. And yet they get that in their own schools uh, and clubs and other things that they're a part of. Yeah. I, uh, I think about all those different type of comments about uh, you speak very well, <laughs> you, uh, uh, your name is very strange, you know, like a lot of different adjectives for like, you know, right. what my name sounds like. And, and before I just say, oh yeah, that they probably just don't know any better and such. But, you know, again, upon reflection, it's like, no, that's actually not very nice to say. You should probably get a little bit more of an education as to, you know, what people are, where they're from, you know, what they're about versus just assuming that because we have a different color of skin, you know, 
it's it's yeah i feel like that there's a lot of that still that's still happening um and so, i would just say that uh, if yeah. i sorry to interrupt uh mm -hmm. you know those are microaggressions i mean of course they're not things we would necessarily take action on but you know it can be soul crushing in a lot of ways to be treated as the other as not belonging here as this not being your country um, mm -hmm. So I want to say that and acknowledge that it is traumatizing for folks. And one thing that we can all do is, you know, when we hear any family member or friend say that they've experienced this, rather than diminish it and say like, oh, it was just a comment, or even if we've experienced it, to actually acknowledge it for what it is. And, you know, in some cases, um, it may not have been meant with malevolence, um, you know, when I was growing up in Alabama, people, some people had never seen someone from India. I mean, they, in fact, would ask dumb questions like, oh, did you grow up with snakes or did you take a, the, which highway did you take to get here? I was like, okay, uh, obviously you need a better education. But the, the point is that it is still a microaggression. It is something that we experience. And it's only by acknowledging that, that we can sort of work toward uh, the answers. But if we don't even acknowledge it or we deny it and we deny its pervasiveness, uh, I think we're, we're not gonna be in a better place anytime soon. Definitely. And I did not get to see Temple of Doom in the theaters but I had a lot of friends ask me if I eat chilled monkey brains and I had no idea what they were talking about. And that right. was ridiculous, but uh, it was a serious question by a lot of them. So um, so what would you advise anyone who has been a victim of Asian American violence or feel like they are in a situation that is escalating? What would you advise them to do to help protect themselves or um, perhaps maybe even mitigate what's happening? Great question. First off, you know, if you've experienced a hate incident, uh, please report it to Stop AAPI Hate. Um, it's an easy to use website. It's only a few questions. You can do it in English. You can also do it in Hindi and Punjabi, and we're working on getting it in up in Urdu and Bangla as well, um, as well as other Asian languages. Uh, and also, you know, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, if you see something, say something. So if you see a manager, uh, or sorry, if you see a cashier uh, discriminating against someone, refusing them service, you know, and they don't have to be from your own ethnic background. If they're African American, Latinx, or Asian American, Pacific Islander, you know, say something to the cashier, say something to the um, the manager, provide help and support to that individual. Also, if you've seen it or witnessed it, you can also report it to our website. Some of the folks that we have gotten reports from are white, they're Latino, they're black. And they said, look, I didn't like what I saw, you know, what I witnessed. And it happened to somebody in my community. So I wanted to say something about it, but definitely try to provide that support. I also think this can really be a galvanizing moment. You m mentioned earlier, Sheila, that you know we see that voting has consequences. Well, we've got to vote every year, every election, and we don't always do that. And um, sadly, there's uh, even data from AAPI data that shows the South Asian American community doesn't engage that much civically. I think mm -hmm. too often we've been taught this lesson, you've got to do well economically, right? We want you to go into medicine or engineering or, you know, those sort of things, I think, are, are comments that our parents or other elders made. And so no matter what field we chose, it was a focus on the economics. We thought, OK, we're going to do well and then these things won't happen to us. But the lesson is nothing's going to make you immune from it. What will help is to build power in our mm -hmm. communities, um, to grow our movement and our capacity to deal with these things. Um, I mean, Michigan's a great example. You see, um, you know, given the, the size and population uh, of the Muslim American community, they've built power uh, at mm -hmm. the local grassroots level, at the state level. And then you have people like, um, 
Rashida Tlaib, uh, who's in Congress, right? Um, and so we can also do that within other parts of the South Asian community as well, is to start building that power um, so that our government responds when things like this happen and can work to prevent them from happening in the first place. That's great. Uh, and I think you provide an excellent segue because uh, Samosa is a group of grassroots activists who are looking to engage in the political system. So what are your recommendations on how uh, we should um, approach our uh, political leaders, um, you know, anybody else that has influence over these matters uh, and our, you know, how can we help them to know our concerns? Another great question. So I would say first off, you know, do some power mapping, right? So what power mapping is, is figuring out who are those people in your community who have power, right? So if you're talking about at a very local level, your school district, right? They have a lot of power about what gets taught in the schools, right? What holidays get celebrated, right? Is it gonna be, um, you know, Diwali and Vesaki and other things, right? Uh, and Eid in addition to Christmas and Hanukkah um, and Rosh Hashanah. Um, do the same with your city council, right? And your county government, who are the people who have power and what do they have power over? Uh, often it's law enforcement, it's public dollars, right? Your tax money, resources for parks and schools and libraries, right? What does the library have in it? Is it material that is in language? Is it material that people like us want to read, right? As opposed to just the classical authors uh, who are typically just white men who died many uh, decades ago. Um, so there are these different things. And I mean, I think right now, this is a moment to urge action. At the very least, every city council in the country can stand up to condemn the hate against Asian American communities. And they don't even necessarily have to have a ton of Asian Americans, right? But they say, look, we stand with those communities. Then you can also look at um, the state level, right? What laws can be changed to enable um, you know, better reporting, uh, resources in language to help uh, victims um, of crime or victims of hate. Uh, there's a lot, we know there are a lot of gaps in our civil rights enforcement. You know, too often we see that, you know, police and law enforcement has resources, but practically nobody else does, right? In uh, Los Angeles, we have a program to respond to hate. It's called LA versus hate. We have a public education campaign. I actually would encourage folks to go to it because you'll see there are even some great South Asian um, images against hate, right? Where people have taken some of the Hindu gods and goddesses, have taken um, you know, Muslim iconography and others and used it to say, we're gonna stand up to hate. And we also have a response network. So if somebody in our community experiences it uh, with the API commun AAPI community, we respond at APCON. But who are gonna be those, com those organizations that respond and are they given money and resources to do that? So that's another thing you can advocate for is like, let's put this infrastructure in place before it becomes much worse or before we see the next thing that happens to our community. Excellent. Um, any other resources or anything else that you can think of that uh, we can do to continue to educate ourselves or reach out to uh, you know, other individuals, anything else that you can think of? I would highly recommend um, a national organization called SALT. Uh, South okay. Asian Americans leading together. They're based in DC and they've mm -hmm. been doing phenomenal work. Uh, they have a lot of materials and reports on issues that impact South Asian American communities. Uh, they also have a toolkit on, you know, what you can do uh, to advocate on different issues. And finally, what they do is they have a national um, conference of all South Asian organizations in this space, the ones that do civic engagement, the ones that work on health, the ones that work on violence prevention. Um, and so I would encourage, you know, if with uh, whether it be with uh, Samosa or other groups, 
to be a part of that, right? Because we really need to grow our capacity um, as South Asian Americans. And, you know, the very last thing I'll say is, please vote, get people in your community to register, to become U.S. citizens, to register to vote and to vote often, right? We see in many, many states, uh, and perhaps we'll see it in Michigan as well, huge voter suppression efforts, really mm -hmm. trying to prevent people who are non-white, non-Republican from voting. And so we've got to mobilize now. We can't wait for 2022 or 2024 to do this work. I think if anything we realized from the last four years is unfortunately we have to be vigilant all the time and that's hard for many of us right we're exhausted i'm exhausted after the trump administration right but mm -hmm. we've got to keep it up in whatever ways we can and just a little bit honestly goes a long way definitely yeah i know that i was tired after the campaign but we know that we have a lot more work to do and it's going to come in a lot of different areas so manju i really appreciate the time sam also really yeah. appreciates your time and the information you provided and uh thanks again yeah you're welcome it's such a great opportunity i appreciate it um and look forward to collaborating with you all in the future <laughs>